Um, so we heard a lot yesterday about capturing workflows in combination with the data. Um, so as well as work in the space, uh, we'll see that research workflows are different than production workflows. Uh, might chips be an opportunity to encourage industry and their modernization of the production floor to link their workflows with the ideas and infrastructure being developed in research. Um, so essentially, how do you connect um, the data workflows um, that are occurring in industry versus in research um, and, and you know, what, what can be done to make that connection? Um, I can start if it's ahead of, I heard the chips word in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. A, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is a very common problem in trying to connect fundamental research with industrial processes, industrial time scales, and urgency. So it's not unique to chips in, in a sense. I think the answer, as many of you have been exploring as well, is really the starting point is the conversation with those industry targets that you're imagining. What you might find is that there are input points where you don't really need to know the full workflow of the industry side. You just need to understand enough to know not to spend your time on some aspect that they'll never adopt or for practical reasons cannot happen. And on the flip side, it does take time to educate industrial researchers who are under time deadlines often to be able to understand the value proposition of the type of study that could be done in the fundamental space. And so that would be more of a conversation of trying to explain where that value proposition comes in, into play. So the CHIPS Act is intending to create spaces for this to happen. So this innovation ecosystem, another one, I know there are many of them to do so, but it will be in this case, a national agenda as a priority for the future innovations. And it is going to be designed such that, so road mapping activities, such as the one we posted from NIST, but across the industry space, well, we want to foster those conversations in specific areas so that those connecting points can be made. And I'm sure there's positive examples um, around here in this, in this meeting, and we could draw from that to input into the other ones. Thank you. Um, actually, there is a very closely related question um, asked by uh, an audience, uh, Orion. Archer Cohen, um, it just it's sort of the same question, but for batteries. So this is uh, addressed to Rajiv. Um, a key problem in battery research is the misalignment with academic testing workflows and industry device level testing. Um, so do you have some um, um, suggestion on sort of how to better align the, the uh, research world priorities and data and, and, um, and data management with the um, industrial level mm -hmm. uh, data, uh, you know, everyone's using ML, but for different purposes. How do you um, really um, connect those? Um, I think it's the same kind of answer in that it, what you named is clearly something that's not going to work for either side if the goal is to accomplish something that can be useful in the in the world. Um, so the, the laboratory academic metrics may be designed to maximize some objective function, and the industry one is different. So the answer is, yeah, it's not about how, it's that it should. And if you have a should, then the first group that's able to do that actually will have an advantage, right? So there's an incentive to go do that. Now, the second part of this question about TRL levels is that it's not really, TRL level is a notional idea about how ideas get into practice. And it's not a be all end all, but it's not a linear progression usually in the, in, in the world. So it's much better to have an idea of context about where the most leverage points for the difference you can make in where you might wanna make take the time to make those connections between an industrial environment and an academic one. The last question answer I'll give is that there are many places where an industrial process, if you just look, they have so many problems. And many of them, there are like a fundamental study, a fundamental science study yeah. is what is exactly needed to get that practical problem resolved. And it's worth taking a little time to find what those are and being clear that the answer you give will make a difference. So it's not so much like mapping them perfectly, it's really more about trying. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. I think that's been my experience as well. But the challenge has always been getting the industry to admit that or describe, admit that they have a problem and then describe these problems in a depth that they you can actually begin to work on them. So yeah, that's are, are true. Going to be, how do you how do you handle that in the context of multiple companies that 
are all kind of competing against each other and an individual company that likes to keep things even trade secret. Yeah. Patented. Well, it turns out if you put out gigantic numbers, like in the chips act, they will, they're willing to do it. That, that, that's <laughs> an interesting to do. So before we even started, before the act passed, there was already all this energy in the industry to talk to each other, competitors talking to each other. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? So the signal sent by the passage of the act shows that there was a recognized need when there are resources put behind it. So although that's not true in every industrial sector, it is now currently true in the semiconductor space. <laughs> and so the conditions are ripe so that there's more people who will listen to you now, I hope, what they should. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Rajiv, would you like to add anything in the energy storage space? Yeah, I think uh, the uh, majority of the innovation side of the, uh, I think uh, the short answer is, I think more conversation needed between uh, the early TRL level to the higher TRL level. The innovation side of it, um, so whenever you have an innovation project, it would be good to include the industry partners from very early on so that they can say whether this is scalable to their standard. Um, so they understand that uh, you know, the materials you develop um, very early on, um, at least a guideline of uh, TEA or LCA, that kind of approaches very early on. Um, uh, but uh, you know, when you, when you have a, a, like situations like a battery testing, so what you, it's more an optimization problem, right? The majority of them uh, end up an optimization problem. The Office of Science folks may not be the ideal people doing those things. So uh, uh, yeah, I think the conversation is needed uh, throughout. Thanks. Um, there was a question uh, for Arunama. Um, uh, you develop a module to use materials project information and link it with downstream calculations. It's a great example of uh, open source development. Uh, kudos to you and the uh, materials project. Um, can you expand on how this came about and what the experience was like? Uh, thank you. So uh, this was a very rewarding experience and we had several such collaborations later on. I, I think the short answer to this was very close collaborations with the experimentalist was very essential in this. There were um, existing data uh, in the, the well-known data, uh, data sites, uh, such as band gaps, structures, formation energies, um, but uh, aqua stability was very much lacking. And our experimental collaborators keep telling us that it's very expensive to grow these materials. It's very, it's time consuming. The human resource um, required to synthesize and test the materials is quite high. So can we look at that with stability from theory somehow so that we can reduce that? And that's where it came about from. And um, the materials project team already had um, certain functionalities to compute pore bit diagrams. We expanded it to be able to um, capture a much larger uh, range of materials by also including metastable materials. Um, um, I, I do want to mention that this project was done as a part of the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. And uh, as a part of that center, there was a very much push from um, the funding source, which was Department of Energy here, to have close collaborations between theory and experiments to accelerate the process of the discovery and optimization of these catalysts. So, uh, I, I think that helped. Great. One, one, of, the, one of the issues that raised by uh, Rajiv and implicit in what uh, Arumna was saying was the accuracy or the need for accurate databases. And um, if you look at poor bay diagrams on the, on the materials um, uh, hub, the, the, the oxide models that they use there are relatively crude. And if you use more sophisticated models that include electron, cor uh, electron correlations, you get different answers. And so um, you're already extending your data to these more complicated cases, uh, computations, these more complicated cases. So how do you balance accuracy versus high throughput? And how do, how do you let the users know the limitations of the data that you have published? Um, perhaps I can touch upon that. Uh, I think very recently the materials project has done a great update on their website where they have disclaimers about um, 
this specific property is severely underestimated for this class of materials. So there's all of those warnings added, uh, put in place. And of course, there's there has to be um, a balance between the existing computing resources we have versus the accuracy level we can achieve. Um, I, I believe the philosophy right now is that if we want to look at very large number of materials and look at their performance, then we have to go with uh, slightly cheaper computing methods and use our search criteria per se to be very loose. And as you have shorter list of materials, you go to hundreds of 50 or 20, something like that, then uh, you can evaluate those materials with uh, more expensive and high fidelity methods. And that's the approach which has been used um, so far in the last um, five or six years. It's been quite successful, um, but definitely we do miss out. We do have false positives. We do have false negatives, um, but definitely it has expanded our material space beyond what we knew a decade back. So hopefully we'll have um, some innovative ideas of uh, how we can leverage the computing resources and time to develop databases which are even higher accuracy than what exists right now. Great. Yeah, I, I as we were talking about accuracy, I, I uh, remember the um, the story or the common saying that um, you know when a, a computational theoretical person presents something, uh, everyone doubts his accuracy. Um, everyone else doubts except themselves. Uh, whereas when an experimentalist presents the data, then um, everyone believes them except themselves. So you know from from this panel, it seems like uh, four out of five of us uh, do computational modeling, um, and in the data. Um, question is often intertwined with uh, computational modeling because we are the one closest to the computer and generate a lot of data. Um, what, what do you guys think about the um, approaches or path forwards to enhance this conversation between uh, people who do computational modeling and, and people who do experimental research? You know, we talked a little bit about connecting researchers with industry, but what about, you know, within research? Um, it seems like uh, we are talking sometimes past each other. Um, Just very quickly, I could like say it's very much the same way. You could replace um, experimentalists with industry, and they'd have the same same issue, right? Sometimes the expectations are just different, or they're just practical. Like there's units in computational space that are easier than the units that are used in experiment. As a very basic example, so I think the more interesting question is if they're not what is. is can we define the relationship between the experimental data and the computational data? Mm. And then is it a constant offset or is it a some structured way of how to understand it? Is trends the best we can do and that's okay. And so I think that's the more valuable conversation. So the value of each is debated, not the accuracy or, or, the, or the correctness of each is the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my comment is also very similar. I think detailed benchmarking is probably the best way to get started. Um, and also, uh, so w one thing I, I just want to point out, um, sometimes when you have a low fidelity models or lower uh, for the sake of having the model, um, it can get obsolete very quickly. Uh, uh, because uh, um, often I, I've been asked the question when I was doing basic DFT calculations uh, for a certain chemical reaction, say that, Oh, you are from National Lab. Why can't you do most accurate one rather than just doing semi empirical one? If you can't do it, nobody else could. So, uh, you know, why don't you make some uh, detailed data sets, those kind of things? So, I, I put a, an example uh, in the chat. Uh, so, we uh, made a, 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 you know, accurate energies of 130,000 molecules. Um, probably the one, it's kind of NIST accuracy. I think we even uh, corrected some of the enthalpy of formation examples in NIST, uh, uh, the gas phase ones, uh, based on this uh, very accurate model of G4MP2, uh, which not many people can do for this scale. Uh, or national labs are probably, uh, we, we have to develop a, a nice work, workflow, uh, intelligent workflow to spend hours and hours of CPU times to generate this data. So um, John Allison has an interesting uh, question for Romna. 
is he says that you're a development of a module to use the materials project information and link it with downstream calculations is a great example of open source development. Kudos to you and the materials project for implementing it. And so he would like to basically understand uh, what your experience was like, how this came about, and is it easily replicated for other people who run databases? Um, Peter, I asked this question a little, a few minutes ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think we're all trying to juggle uh, looking at the document and, and, and listening and, and talking at the same time. Um, but yeah, if there's anything additional, I think Arunima pointed out that like the collaboration with experimentalists was also very important. Um, um, so uh, uh, Rajiv um, uh, raised a good question of benchmarks. Um, what types of benchmarks uh, would be really useful to have in the space of uh, microelectronics or or energy storage or or related areas, in your opinion, um, Arunima, maybe you can start. Yeah, thank you. So I I think in um, the area of microelectronics, one of the challenges um, which I see is that um, there's very limited experimental data of fundamental properties um, of it is there, but for only a handful of materials which are extensively used in the industry, um, like silicon, aluminum nitride, gallium nitride, they're very well understood. We understand their defects, we understand them, we understand their integration, we understand them to the point of um, also in, in, um, of using them in integrated devices. Um, but I believe that as we move forward, the benchmark uh, data should be expanded and for that, the experimental data, should, there needs to be more experimental data. And as a part of the Ultra Center, we are curating the experimental data um, for diamond um, alloys of these nitrides and oxides. Um, it, it's rather challenging because you're uh, doing the research and every couple of months you find you have a new understanding of the material itself. So I think the focus should be on um, having good experimental data are easily available, perhaps uh, changing um, the culture of data curation and experimentation as well, uh, documenting them in um, e-notebooks, e-lab notebooks like lab archives in standardized formats would be helpful and sharing them openly with researchers would make the benchmarking easier in this field specifically. Eric or Rajiv, would you like to add to that? I can let me. I can add just another type of example to Arunima's one. So that would be like in the semiconductor device arena. So there are a lot of conceptual differences around device architectures, and to make a mm -hmm. fundamental logic unit or a memory unit, something like that. And so it's not only different material sets where you need the data, as Arunima was saying, but you also need a way to compare one kind of architecture to another architecture on the same basis in some way. So mm -hmm. there have been attempts at that in the past to try to get to a, a benchmark that can compare apples, turn things into apples, apples, so apples, oranges. And so when things become more complex, then that might be something to think about, about what kind of ways to harmonize what a benchmark might be across a creative space where it might be different, more than just a single material and more than a single architecture. Yeah, figures of merit. Um, I think those are really important. Um, you know, photovoltaics really, uh, really um, pin that down. Was the simple it, it, in a sense that you have basically, you know, just a few numbers um, or, or boiling it down to one. Um, but yeah, electronics. There are a lot of different competing um, uh, design goals, um, so so it, it can be a little harder. Um, Arun put um, a question in the chat about uh, electronics and chips act. Um, um, the question was, uh, what is the primary role of computation in directly aiding and accelerating manufacturing? So Arunima talked about a lot about um, defects and DFT calculations. Um, it, it, do you guys envision that being used directly in uh, manufacturing to, to guide the design um, of uh, semiconductors? Um, I, uh, I can start by answering uh, parts of that question. Um, I guess I agree that um, computations can play an important role in aiding 
and accelerator manufacturing. Um, a lot of, um, as, as an academic researcher, I'm finding a lot of funding agencies are interested in the course design approach going all the way from materials to uh, the system level, including device simulations um, and uh, materials growth. Um, I, I believe here, um, what we're looking at is um, not per se, discovery of new materials, but a better understanding of existing materials as they're integrated with different components. Um, I also see uh, several questions about thermal management. And those are, um, if you are integrating these uh, materials with uh, thermal management aspects and trying to dissipate the heat away, how does that interface look like? Uh, so these interfaces could have complex defects like dislocations, brain boundaries, point defects, and all of these need to be studied well. DFT, as we, as we all um, know, it can only tackle uh, certain periodic systems and it does have its limitations, but it is useful um, in aiding the under, uh, understanding of how the defects can um, improve the device performance as opposed, to, um, as opposed to be a hurdle in improving the device performance. Um, I, I, I personally believe many body perturbation methods are better for looking at uh, defect energy levels, uh, which are relevant for these applications um, because they're they are in better agreement with experiments. But like I mentioned, we also need good quality experiments to be able to compare with. Um, and um, that's where I believe the primary role of uh, first principles competition especially would be. I'll just add that Computation is viewed as a major enabler and data as a major enabler for this technology since it's so many complicated aspects as Aruna pointed out. And so within specific domains, that's pretty well, that can be well understood. But I don't think there's a unifying idea of how computational overall can link these pieces together. I mean, it's a constant uh, challenge for all of us. So Arunima did identify interfaces. These are all mostly interfaces devices. And so that is a gap I don't think is fully filled. And then attention to just how we do, like we try to link lens scales across and different time scales, that similar principle would be, is pretty much not filled within the industry at the moment is what I would say. Great. Um, thermal management that also came up in the in the questions. Um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of our computational approaches actually, um, you know, don't take temperature into account. Um, so, uh, and um, Rajiv and Arunima and maybe Eric, like, do you, can you guys think of um, some area where um, we can bridge this gap that um, modeling is working? And then, you know, I guess it's not just temperature. Modeling tends to work on. Um, short time scale, small length scale, and low temperature, whereas real life, you know, it's a lot more that. Yeah, in, ba in battery world, I think uh, the diffusion of ions is one of the uh, classic examples. You probably need a, a temperature dependency. Um, and also, uh, we were, we were uh, um, you know, trying to develop uh, materials for a uh, faster conduction. Uh, ionic conduction for uh, magnesium or calcium or zinc. These these are uh, these ions don't move that fast even at the DFT standard. Uh, if you really want to do so, um, we probably have to heat it up the system significantly higher than an actual system is. So it's kind of an approximation. I think um, having said that, when you know the scales are sometimes the bridge is too far from the atomistic scales to a uh, meso scale modeling. I think, uh, I mean, there is probably need a better approaches. Maybe uh, machine learning, machine learning potentials, and those kind of things may play a bigger role uh, for for fabricating in you know, a nanoscale devices. I think now, you know, we can utilize those models for uh, computations. Great. Yeah. Um. Um. I. I think you know there's always going to be gap, and, and one of the um, points that were that was raised earlier um, um, about electronic notebooks and and so on. Um, I think one of the challenge um, is to get the experimental data that that 
it's out there, you know, into a place. Um, so do you guys have any, uh, I guess specifically Eric, do you guys have any um, thoughts on to um, sort of more widespread implementation of capturing experimental data um, and then sort of be allowing the connection with um, computational data to be made more, more effectively? Well, we're certainly considering those ideas in in um, in the the chips R and D programs overall. So the National Semiconductor Technology Center, like I think, I, yeah, is uh, has suggestions from our industrial advisory committee for shared resources, and we that's been a, a common thing for the value exactly what you proposed. How that will come together and where it housed, I think that remains to be determined. Within the NIST metrology programs and the grand challenges I identified, a lot of the same principles are there, but they're tied to like validation of measurement as an enabler. So that's uh, probably a more natural place for this community to connect with. And, and certainly, as you know, all of us at NIST are, are deeply invested in MGI and how it can come together. And so within as the metrology program develops, you know, I would expect that would be a very you know, ongoing conversation about how to accelerate that in some way. Great. Um, so I think um, our session is uh, drawing to a close. Um, does anyone have last minute burning questions? I think there were a few on the- um, uh, one, a few I think one last question is coming in, I think. Okay, yeah, Peter, go ahead. No, well, it's just, I have three, three, uh, th it says question for the, and then it stopped. So I, I thought someone was writing, I guess. They, just, oh, wait, here it comes, okay. Aron, I think it's writing something. Uh, yeah, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, we, we, technically, go ahead. We, we technically have time till 2.20. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to request that if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, please feel free to. Uh, maybe I can quickly ask one question that I had for everybody in, in the panel. That's what I was I was just writing. But, uh, you know, in the context of your own research and for, you know, future preparedness, future discovery, how do you view training of, you know, students, postdocs, junior researchers, senior researchers, et cetera. So, you know, you can all give your specific, you know, opinion on that. Like, you know, what, what, you know, how do you think we should be training, like, you know, new researchers or even existing people? Do they, you know, need more data science and machine learning knowledge, data management knowledge, more like, you know, uh, specific, like, you know, components, device, you know, uh, information, uh, that kind of stuff. So, you know, please uh, give us your opinion on that. Yeah, uh, any uh, you know anybody can start that. Yeah, let me paraphrase. What do kids these days need to learn? Yeah, uh, maybe I can start being in academia. Uh, one of uh, the most important roles I have is mentorship of the students, and uh, I, I believe that uh, there's a, a huge progression in workforce development, uh, not just on the PI level but also on the university and the national level. I find that on the PI level, of, uh, of course, we provide resources to our students. Uh, it's very much important in this day and age if you're doing um, computational research, for example, and even experimental research to know some form of coding so that you can automate certain processes which are repetitive. You want to minimize the, the, the human time required in those processes. In computational research, of course, um, it's very much important to, to learn coding, and usually Python is the easiest way to go. But I also noticed that universities are doing quite a lot. At ASU, we have um, a research center, which has um, more than um, 4,000 CPU nodes. And it's a part of the center, the staff has a student training workshop uh, twice a year. And these are three day workshops. And they have uh, three hour sessions for teaching, let's say, Python, basics of machine learning. Um, how to use supercomputing resources, how to parallelize your code if you're writing your own code. And I think these sort of um, efforts which are coming jointly from all researchers at one institution are important. It, it, uh, it, it would be rather challenging for individual PIs at, in academia to provide all of these uh, essential skills to the future workforce. So that's very helpful. And also on the national level, um, uh, national uh, computing facilities like NURSE and EXCEED have wonderful documentation and wonderful resources for students to um, self-learn a lot of the important 
aspects of um, computing, including AI and machine learning. So I believe th these are, uh, are making very good ad advancements. And the only thing I would add other than everything, Arun, everything is on the table is necessary to do that. Um, I, I do think, you know, definitely practice on asking questions is obviously important for a scientist. But for wherever the given field is, real experiential conversations with the beneficiaries of that type of work, the computational and linking together work is really valuable just to get a charge of how much difference you can make, but also refining exactly how you approach it because it's now not just, it's both an academic problem as well as a targeted to what it could help with in something in the real world if it's relevant to that. Right, absolutely. Um, um, one other yeah. question along these lines, I mean, this, this gets to the one of the central issues of the CHIPS Act and that is workforce development. And so how are you going to, if you look at the numbers estimated for what's, what's gonna be required to keep things moving forward, they're really quite substantial. And so how is, how is the CHIPS Act, the folks running the CHIPS Act, you going to interact with industry, uh, in academe in order to produce these folks necessary for industry? How's that gonna work? Well, that is a very big challenge for sure. So there's multiple prongs as you would expect. Um, it starts from the incentives program to where there will be the incentives will have com will be coming with hiring plans for construction and fab operators. The NSF has a major effort, hundreds of millions of dollars to work with institutions for training programs um, and educational programs in partnership with industry. So that's a clear place to start. Then for us in the Commerce Department, you know, we're representing the industry side, the employer side. So the NSTC, right now the industry is very fragmented. Companies don't agree upon what skills they need. They often don't wanna tell other, each other what skills they think they need. Um, um, and that's starting to be broken down too. So we have those components of organizing the industry side for what are the basic competencies that don't necessarily mean a specific engineering degree. It might be coding, for example, all the things Arunima was, was outlining. Then the next trick is to create career pathways, not just individual job focused. So if you're in the industry and you start as a, as a technician in a fab, you know we're gonna encourage and be building ways for those technicians that want to go into the research side or to start a company side, to be able to navigate within the industry, to gain credentials and skills, come to an institution that might go from basic engineering all the way into computational materials design. Um, so by that the value of having such a connected ecosystem is to do that. Honestly, at the end of the day, this entire enterprise is consists of people, it's not the things. And so if you're not concentrating on where they go, where they come from and where they go, then you're really just not doing it right. But each part of that, we all have a role to play for that, right? So on the employer side or the training side, often together. Great. Um, with that, thank you so much for all our panelists uh, who've shared their uh, talks and, um, and thoughts about these matters. Um, uh, Arun would like to remind everyone that um, we now have a poster session. Um, he will share how to join. Um, it's on the Gather Town link that's posted in the chat. Um, we look forward to the rest of your uh, participation in the MARTA meeting. Um, thank you so much.